Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Backer and welcome to Off the Wall Novels. Joining me as my tie clip is Pringle Backer. He is my co-host. And today I want to share some thoughts on the recognitions because I decided today that I am not going to finish this book. And I feel extremely conflicted. I have such mixed feelings about the book. And it's funny because usually when people say mixed feelings, we kind of zero in on the bad part. And so I want to start with the good, that there is brilliance in this book. There's genius in this book. And it does disappoint me that I couldn't just muster what it takes to finish the last 200 pages, because I got through 730 pages of this book, and I would say the first 300 pages I was in. I was captivated. And I do think it's a testament to William Gaddis's brilliance that in spite of my frustration at different times, I was captivated enough to read 700 pages of this. Um, but that being said, it... Well, no, actually, you know what? Like I said, I'm going to stick with the positive for a second. That there were some amazing choices in this book um, related to its connections to Faust. For example, I was very delighted to find that the guy who is like the Mephistopheles analog... Um, Rectal Brown, which is such a silly, like, Pinchonian name, even though this book came first. Um, he had a black poodle, which is exactly how Mephistopheles first appears to Faust before he transforms into Mephistopheles, or the devil. And so there are some really cool connections. Um, in one of the inscriptions, they talk about the homunculus, which is an alchemical symbol of, like, a, a surrogate... Or not, not a surrogate, but like a constructed person. A, uh, a human that is made through the alchemical process that obviously has all of this like symbolic portent. And it is right on point with the themes of this book of artifice and counterfeit and how people can kind of like represent all of these things in spite of themselves. And so a lot of that was really cool. And I was extremely struck by... Um, Reverend Guyon's character and how he's this Protestant minister, but then is always sneaking in these like occult images and uh, references in his sermons, and that like ramps up to more explicit uh, investigation of his interest in the occult. And I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler because it is pretty early on, but when he, um, I think it's an orangutan or, or some kind of ape that they have. It is heavily, heavily alluded to um, in a way that I don't think is supposed to be ambiguous. It's just indirect that he sacrifices this ape early in the story. And that scene in particular really reminded me of Infinite Jest. And in fact, a lot of the choices in the book feel like Infinite Jest, even though the subject matter is entirely different. It really makes sense that David Foster Wallace must have read this book because... Um, in spite of all of his comparisons to Pynchon, this feels more like David Foster Wallace than Pynchon, in my opinion. And in further connections uh, to Pynchon, like a lot of the evocative names and the thematic exploration in V feel like this book, that everything is kind of couched in these layered references, and um, whether the person, place, or thing is trying to or not, it evokes something that came before. And it makes sense because like within a postmodern society, uh, we've inherited so much significance from history, and the way that we interpret the world has kind of been passed down from religion and from history, and it creates this kind of like fractal or this blur of meaning that is not always easy to pin down. And so that was extremely beautiful, and the idea of that I think is just so gorgeous. And in addition to that, I said this I think in my first video on the recognitions, it feels a lot more like a novel than Infinite Jest or Gravity's Rainbow or a lot of the other postmodern doorstops. Like, it actually feels like the characters are real people. The dialogue um, is always praised in William Gaddis, and like 99% of the dialogue I loved. The party scene that's supposed to be like one of the best scenes in the book completely lost me. Um, but at its best, I think it occurs between Esther and Wyatt, I thought the relationship scenes explored in part one were excellent. And in fact, I wanted to just see a whole 900 page book about that. Um, because going forward, it seems very intentional that Wyatt, the protagonist, kind of like drifts out of focus. 
And I think that choice is conceptually fascinating, but as a reading experience, it, it just kind of sucked because I was invested in that. That's the part in part one that made me want to keep on reading. And further in that line of thought, it seems like Otto is aspiring to like copy Wyatt's persona and mannerisms and like literary and religious prowess because he also involves himself with Esther, I believe while Wyatt and Esther are still together. And there's one passage in particular that I thought was really beautiful where after establishing that Otto is kind of trying to be like Wyatt, he also creates like a surrogate, or I keep saying surrogate, like, like a, a version of himself in the play. And so in this very short paragraph, you get the fake character in Otto's play that's supposed to be Otto, but then Otto is supposed to be like a fake Wyatt. And... That I think is really cool and kind of reminds me of some of my analysis of Licorice Pizza, where every character being an actor has all of these like layered identities on top of them. And that's really fun and something that we also see in V by Thomas Pynchon. That's like a very classic staple of postmodernism as far as I know. So that is, um, I think, what is so cool about the book. But what I found my experience was in reading it is that I thought the ideas were very cool. But it was just not a fun reading experience for me. And even though it feels a little bit more like a well-crafted novel than uh, than Infinite Jest or Gravity's Rainbow, I think that in both of those authors' work, they always feel like a little bit more desperate to please the reader. For as tedious and difficult as some of those sections are, it seems like they're like, hey, trust me, this is worth it, you know? And I feel confident in saying by page 700 is that he seems to be putting all the most important parts in there so indirectly and so glancingly, kind of like an in infinite jest that like the scene with Hal and John Wayne and uh, Gately in the cemetery is just like barely peppered in there and then they move on to something else. But it seemed like the something else in infinite jest had a lot to it that made it feel fun that the plot was only uh, glancingly alluded to. Where in here, I'm just like, there are just so many references, and a lot of the prose and the long sentences just felt opaque. And in Pynchon, some of his long sentences and difficult syntax, after a couple rereads of it, I can be like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing here. And in here, it just, it, it just seems like it shuts me out as a reader, unfortunately. And so I have decided not to finish it, which again, kind of feels silly because I only have 200 pages more of it, but I think the last 200 pages of this book that I read past the halfway point was already really testing me. And uh, it, it it's weird because I, I feel kind of like a failure for not committing myself to finishing this book, but then on the flip side, it almost feels like an affirmation of self that I'm like, I really have nothing to gain by finishing this book and that's what ultimately made me decide to pull the bookmark out and just set it aside. Because I think that the the interesting parts were so few and far between by the middle. And I just found myself wondering, like, why is he making it like this? You know? And and I was even, like, <laughs> hitting people up on Instagram being like, what what are we doing here? You know? And I was asking myself that, like, why am I putting myself through this? And... I started to reflect on like the only reason I would want to finish this book is to say that I have finished it and I have decided long ago that I don't value that and saying that I have finished something because people don't care um, I don't think people are gonna care that I did not finish this book and so like I I hope I don't I'm not like discouraging anybody from reading it if they're interested in it but I, I just am kind of disappointed in it because I wanted to like it so bad and the parts that were good were so good that it just it just makes me wish that there was a little bit more that appealed to the reader because a lot of the choices that I found interesting at the beginning of him just barely tethering the information together to give you just enough to imply who is speaking or who's getting the focus because he's not always using the characters names that was really cool but it just like wears you down after hundreds and hundreds of pages where every new section, it just feels like you're starting back from square one trying to figure it out. Whereas, again, in, in some of these other novels, like The Chaos of Gravity's Rainbow was at, time frust at times frustrating, but 
it also it, it just seemed fun enough to, to like keep pushing through and even with the references in this I eventually realized and I think I'm right about this that like you're not really supposed to know every reference but rather it informs the characters right it, it just kind of tells you of the world that they're living in and that when Wyatt is kind of losing his mind and just like vomiting out all of these religious references it it's just about him it's about him having consumed all of this information presumably from the reverend um but again that being said it's like it'll be like 10 big old pages of that of him just vomiting reference after reference and proper noun after proper noun from religious history and it, it, just, it just wasn't fun you know and so i think um I just kind of wanted to get these ideas out because I do feel genuinely conflicted. I'm truly ambivalent about this book. Um, but it ultimately led me to just question, like, one, why am I reading it? And then two, what is the point of choosing to express these ideas as a novel? You know, because you guys know me, I love experimental literature and I love kind of like questioning a lot of the conventions, but then... I, I hate to say it, this is going to make me sound ignorant, but it just seems like he's just making it difficult. And it it doesn't seem to inform the theme. And I'm sure I'm wrong about that. I'm sure people with a deeper understanding of this book could tell me, like, the difficulty actually informs what's going on. Because that's what it felt like in Infinite Jest, is that a, a big theme of that book is the slog of self-isolation and achievement. And the footnotes in that, I think just really propel that theme and in this one it just seems like he could just tell me what's going on you know like the the stuff that's going on and and the long dialogue scenes are interesting enough on their own like i don't see why he feels the need to bury the most important parts if that makes sense and i'm sure that there's a satisfying answer to that but it might be related to like john barth's idea expressed in Lost in the Funhouse, the collection that like since everything has just been done so many times before, we as artists have no choice in a postmodern society but to just make these topographical shifts, kind of like a Mobius strip, on the storytelling process, right? And to me, that might have been the intention with making it so difficult to figure out what's going on. Um that, you know, he was, I guess, writing this in the 50s and was obviously extremely well read. Um, but then it just seems like, wh why do we have to fight so hard in order to just get the, the premise of the scene? You know, because again, the scenes are interesting. The scenes are great. But I, I just was like, oh man, like I've already seen the move of him not naming the character. And then we just have to um, like figure out through context, like who is speaking. And then there are so many characters in it um, that I just found very unlikable too. I did not like any of the New Yorkers. I liked Otto, I, just cause he was so pathetic. I loved his fake sling from him having like gone down to the Banana Republic and him obviously not being injured, but he's always just like wanting to remind people that he went down there. But like all of the other artsy New Yorkers and those scenes, even though they're very well rendered and the dialogue is just razor sharp, I just didn't like them. And I, I just kept wondering, like, why am I being asked to care about them? Because I get they're artists and they deal with this theme of artifice and all of these different ways. But to me, I just kept being like, yeah, but what about Wyatt? I wanted to hear about his story. I liked Esther and Wyatt. I wanted, to, I wanted it to be more about that. And I'll end it on a positive note because one of the coolest and most interesting scenes in the book, I would say, is pretty close to the beginning when... Esther discovers that Wyatt entered the seminary briefly and that she accuses him of like being a priest on a fundamental level. And I thought that was really beautiful because in spite of his desire to like be with her and she obviously loves him more than he loves her, um, he does have this kind of like manic reverence for maybe religion, but also just for art and for self-isolation and there are those scenes of him like just brooding in his workroom um making his paintings and everything and so i just thought that was such a fantastic scene 
that felt very real, but also very symbolic and thematic as well, because a priest approaches them that apparently Wyatt had known at the seminary. And it just felt super cool that the problem in their relationship was that he was fundamentally as a personality, a priest. So again, um, I, I hope I didn't talk anybody out of reading this. If I'm way off on this and, and you, like you guys have anything in order to make me see it in a different way, I'd love to hear it. But as an affirmation of self, I cannot in good faith finish this book because I just found my eyes were just like going over the text and I'm just like, I just don't care anymore. Like this, this sentence is a paragraph long and he'll, he'll put in like 25 nouns, comma, it. And I'm like, I'm not going to sit and read this five times to figure out what noun it refers to and all these like layered religious references and everything like that. So I don't know. Again, I, I feel so conflicted. Um, I'm trying to think of it positively because it's not like I didn't get anything. It wasn't a waste of time. There was a ton of great stuff in here, but I think as a reader and especially as a writer, I'm kind of glad that I read this because it just tells me like what I don't want to do. And not that I could, like I get this man is a genius, but sometimes it seems like they're so resistant to just using the conventions of storytelling in order to engage the reader that I, I, I don't know, couldn't do it anymore. Um, I might've liked this more a couple years ago when I was kind of in my postmodern heyday and my recent interest in the occult led me to check this one out. But ultimately I feel good about not finishing it. So there we go. That was my, my, I'm just trying to process. I'm in mourning of my inability to finish this book. I obviously have mixed emotions. Let me know what you guys think if I'm way off base or anything like that. This has been Daniel Becker. Have a good day, guys.